Hey everyone, uh, and welcome back to my short series uh, talking about uh, some interesting medieval facts through the lens of A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, and also sort of getting into some A Song of Ice and Fire theories through this. Uh, and today I'm going to take a, a little bit of a niche topic, uh, as if this series uh, on its own wasn't already pretty niche, uh, in that I want to talk about the importance of numbers uh, in the Middle Ages uh, and the way they would sort of fudge numbers uh, and bring this around into, again, uh, sort of the history of Westeros. So to start off with, Numbers were important symbols in the Middle Ages, uh, and in many respects we can consider numbers due to their importance in uh, Christian symbolism, uh, but there's also a few cases of them uh, being possibly carried over from pre-Christian roots. Uh, but a lot of these are uh, definitely can be viewed through the lens of Christianity. Uh, so, for instance, take the number seven, uh, which is very important in Christian roots uh, due to being the number of days in the week, which itself came from the story of the seven days of creation in the creation myth in Genesis. Uh, likewise, we can also see 12 as an important uh, number that we can definitely see in Christianity, uh, the 12 disciples uh, of Christ while he was alive, uh, and then the 12 apostles of Christ after the resurrection. Uh, and you can also tie this into natural phenomenon or uh, non-Christian beliefs with things like the 12 signs of the zodiac, uh, the 12 months of the year, and other natural phenomenon. Uh, five, we can also consider five an important uh, number in Christian symbology. Uh, the five wounds of Christ, uh, is is a big one. This was actually re uh, represented with the pentagram. Uh, the pentagram isn't uh, specifically a Christian symbol or anything. We can also see the pentagram taking uh, an important place in uh, things like pre-Christian, you know, classical Greek and Roman religion. Uh, but it became a, a, a Christian symbol, particularly associated with the five wounds of Christ. Uh, but we can also see it represented in uh, in other sort of Christian symbolism as well as natural symbolism. Uh, so, for instance, in uh, the story Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, which also happens to be the first recorded use of the word pentacle in English, uh, has a, a long list of symbolism for the pentacle, for the pentagram, uh, which was the emblem that Sir Gawain had on his shield. And it tied it, uh, importantly, with the five wounds of Christ, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but other Christian symbolism, such as the five joys of St. Mary, uh, as well as uh, natural world symbolism, the five senses, uh, the five fingers on each hand. Uh, so again, we can see five as, as a really important number. Uh, but what you could argue is the most important number in terms of uh, early Christian symbolism is the number three, and that's really where I'm going to be focusing. Uh, so for one, it has a lot of Christian meaning, uh, probably the most important of which we might consider being the Trinity. Uh, you know, the one of the fundamental concepts in Christianity uh, definitely mainstream Christianity in the Middle Ages. Some of the early sects of Christianity uh, seem to have had slightly different uh, ideas about the Trinity, but we can understand the Trinity definitely in the medieval context as being sort of the, the fundamental belief system in Christianity of the one God and three persons, you know, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and again, we can also see three in not just sort of these theological concepts, but also in uh, the stories of Christianity, such as Christ rising again on the third day. Uh, and again, we can also see this in a lot of non-Christian belief systems. Uh, so the one I'm going to focus on a bit is the number three seems to be important in Celtic mythology. Uh, so for instance, you have uh, the concept of triple deities. Uh, so, for instance, the Morrigan, uh, which is a 
Uh, war goddess is sometimes represented as a triad of women. Uh, likewise, we also have uh, a lot of Irish sovereignty goddesses are represented in triads. Uh, and this isn't unique to Celtic mythology. Uh, we also see sort of triple pairings of deities in, for instance, Roman mythology. Uh, something that's uh, a bit more unique to Celtic mythology is uh, this idea of the triple death, uh, which is somebody dying in three ways. Uh, so, for instance, one of the stories about this, which I'll uh, quickly retell sort of your, your Cliff Notes version of it, is uh, there was a story of a young man who didn't believe in the magical powers of Merlin. Uh, so obviously this is a later medieval tale that seems to be informed by this earlier pre-Christian Celtic belief. Uh, so he goes to Merlin and asks him, how am I going to die? And Merlin says, you're going to be hanged from a tree. Uh, and then he leaves. And then the next day he comes back wearing a disguise. So Merlin doesn't recognize him. Uh, and he says, how am I going to die? And he says, oh, you're going to die by falling off a cliff. Uh, and then the day afterwards, he wears a different disguise, still is unrecognized, and uh, asks the same question. How am I going to die? Merlin says he's going to drown. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's building up evidence that Merlin is a, is a fraud because obviously, you know, he's getting different reports about how he's going to die. Uh, when, you know, because he's actually the same person, really they should all be coming the same results. Uh, so anyway, so he goes to, to, you know, expose Merlin, and while he's riding to, to the town he's on, uh, his horse gets spooks and throws him, and he falls off a cliff uh, that's uh, going into a river valley. Uh, and then his leg gets caught in a branch that's uh, sort of on the side of this hill that he just fell off of, uh, and he dangles with his head just under the, the river. Uh, so he ends up dying three deaths simultaneously, being he fell off the cliff, he was hung from the tree, and he was drowned, you know, dying in three ways at once, just as Merlin uh, prophesied. Uh, so that's, you know, sort of how we can understand the triple death, is that, that three ways of death uh, occurring simultaneously. Uh, we can also see this possibly in the, the Lindau man bog body. Uh, this is a bog body found in pre-Roman, or possibly pre-Roman, I should say, uh, Britain, which is usually seen as a uh, as a ritually sacrificed body that it, uh, that shows signs <clears throat> that shows signs of these triple deaths. Uh, he seems to have been uh, either like hung or garroted, you know, ritually strangled, uh, struck on the head. And I can't actually remember at the moment what the third death was, so I'll be sure to, to put that in the slide. Uh, so that's generally seen as uh, sort of a, a more concrete evidence uh, of a triple death occurring in a pagan Celtic context. Uh, although it's worth pointing out that we don't know this is necessarily the case. Uh, because uh, it, it hasn't been dated conclusively to the pre-Roman period, <laughs> And if it is a Roman era body, then it's most likely not a ritual sacrifice. Uh, the Romans were very intolerant of the Druids and Celtic Druidic belief. Uh, and they outlawed human sacrifice as part of it. That's something they saw as particularly barbaric. Uh, so if we're more open to the idea of the body of uh, Lindau man, being Roman era, then it would most likely not be an instance of this ritual human sacrifice. Uh, so it is possibly a good example uh, of, a, of this happening in real world uh, situations, you know, something that is uh, pagan and Celtic rather than uh, sort of the echo of this in medieval Christian era stories. Uh, so we have this number three being a very important symbol both in uh, in Christian symbolism and in Celtic symbolism as well. Uh, so as a result, we have uh, a series of, of texts known as the Welsh Triads, uh, which are, as it might suggest, uh, short lists of three things uh, from medieval Wales. Most of these seem to be surviving from 
uh, sort of the high and uh, late medieval periods. And again, they're, they're fairly simple, uh, nice lists of things grouped in threes. Uh, so for instance, this is one. The three arrogant men of the Isle of Britain, Gwaibi the Arrogant, and Sawo High Chief, and Arwen Penier the Arrogant. Uh, and it, it's a list of things in that, you know, the three great chiefs, the three great poets, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, before I get too far into discussing uh, the Welsh triads, I, w I would like to point out I have essentially no knowledge of the Welsh language. Uh, so I, it seems highly likely to me uh, that I will be mispronouncing a lot of these names, and I apologize for that. Uh, if you do happen to, to be a Welsh speaker, I would love if you could leave comments uh, sort of helping me get these pronunciations correctly. Uh, so as I said, a lot of these uh, Welsh triads are built around the idea that there's three important things. Uh, however, uh, what I find very interesting is there's a lot of cases where they fudge the numbers uh, to, to be able to list things other than three and sort of try to trick you into thinking that there's three things, sticking with the importance of the number three. Uh, so for instance, this is the three red ravagers of the Isle of Britain. Ruin, son of Belly, Lua the skillful hand, and Morgan to the wealthy. But there was one who was a red ravager greater than all three. Arthur was his name. For a year, neither grass nor plants used to spring up when, where one of those three would walk. But where Arthur went, not for seven years. Now, so that's a really interesting tale. Uh, or, you know, a really interesting uh, bit of text uh, that has a, a bunch of interesting things going on. Uh, but the one that's sort of important for our discussion now is uh, you can see the way that they actually snuck four names into this list of the three Red Ravagers in their triads. Uh, I mean, you could take a, a sort of legalistic approach and say that it didn't say Arthur was one of the Red Ravagers. Uh, I mean, actually, technically he did. He says he was a Red Ravager, although not one of the three Red Ravagers, I suppose. Uh, so you can argue that we're not supposed to include Arthur as one of the three Red Ravagers. But he definitely is. It's, he's described as a Red Ravager, uh, not only one of the three, but the greatest of the Red Ravagers. Uh, so you can see the, the wording that they're doing is sneaking a fourth one in there. You know, they really want to talk about four great Red Ravagers. Uh, however, because of the importance of the number three, uh, culturally in terms of the triads, as well as just the symbolism of the number, rather than just saying the four great Red Ravagers, they, they have to be sneaky about it. Uh, and you can also see this in the opposite direction. So another triad uh, reads, these are my three battle horsemen, and Lewid of the Breastplate and the Pillar of the Cymru, Caradog. And uh, it, it, you can sort of see the sorts of languages they're using. You know, it, it's as I read it out there, it seemed quite natural to say, well, there's only two names. Uh, and there are, but they're sort of doing interesting things with it. Uh, again, the, the first name starts with and uh, to sort of prime your brain into thinking, oh, this is, you know, there was a name said before it. Uh, and, you know, if, if it wasn't me reading these out singularly, and instead you just had a rhythm, the, the three kings so-and-so-and-so-and-so-and-so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so and the three poets so-and-so-and-so-and-so-and-so, uh, and the three battle horsemen and Lewis and Caradog. Uh, you know, the, you know if, if you weren't paying attention closely you could, and you were just sort of in that rhythm of three and three and three, uh, that you might overlook the fact that there wasn't actually uh, sort of a first name. Uh, likewise, well, I s just sort of said uh, Lewis of the Breastplate. Uh, in Welsh, it, it sort of looks more like uh, a, a name and then a surname. Likewise, Caradog is the pillar of the Kimri, who is Caradog. Uh, so by giving these extra names and including that and uh, in, in the first name uh, to sort of continue this rhythm of, of the three names, even though it is only listing two names, uh, it could potentially, uh, seems like it's trying to trick the audience into thinking, well, there really were three battle horsemen, uh, despite there only being the two. Uh, and uh, I've, I've picked those two out just because 
they they show the the general trend of how they're tricking uh, of how they're using this number three, even when there's actually four names or only two names. You know, the Red Ravengers and the Battle Horsemen, showing this well. Uh, I also only use two just because, uh, as I said, I, I don't really know the Welsh language, uh, so I wanted to save myself the embarrassment of uh, attempting to, to say these Welsh names and save uh, Welsh speakers the secondhand embarrassment of uh, listening to me mispronounce uh, your, your wonderful culture. Uh, but if, if you do go through the triads, and I encourage you to do so, they're very interesting, uh, you can see uh, that it, it's, I mean, most of them are lists of three, but it's not uncommon to see them using these sorts of techniques to fudge the numbers, particularly with four, a lot more than two. Uh, they'll they'll say, you know, the three so-and-so and then someone greater or and then someone more and also this fourth thing, you know, and so on uh, of sort of adding more information, but trying to sort of keep it phrased as if it's only saying three when really it's saying uh, four. And I think the best explanation for this is, again, the powerful symbolism of the number three culturally in terms of uh you know, religion with uh, three being important in Christian uh, symbology, as well as their inheritance as a Celtic culture, you know, a three in the importance of three in Celtic uh, religions, as well as from both of those, uh, you know, by the time the triads are getting written down, they're likely coming from a cultural standpoint where triads are an important cultural force. So again, it, it makes more sense for them to say it's three and fudge the numbers than to just list two or just list four. Uh, and I just think that's, that's interesting the way that uh, number symbolism is being used and numbers being messed with to, to include that importance of the number symbolism. Uh, so bringing it from real world history to Game of Thrones, uh, I would start with a simple question. Uh, which is, what are the seven kingdoms? And that might seem like a, a weird question, uh, but I, I want to emphasize, what are the seven kingdoms? Not what is the seven kingdoms. You know, we, we can all uh, sort of understand the seven kingdoms as the, the main political entity in Westeros, south of the wall. Uh, but, you know, what, what actually are the seven kingdoms? Well, we can start by listing out the, the districts of the seven kingdoms. Maybe that'll work. Uh, you have the Westerlands, the North, the Iron Islands, uh, the Vale, the Reach, Dorne, the Crownlands, and the Stormlands. Well, that's that's too much. That's nine. Uh, okay, so it seems like obviously we can't just say every district in in uh, in in Westeros counts as a kingdom. Uh, so instead, let's look at uh, the history. You know, what is, uh, you know, what is the conquests of Aegon the Conqueror? You know, the establishment of the Seven Kingdoms. Well, he conquers the West, uh, the Westerlands. He conquers the Reach, the Vale, the North, the Stormlands, and the Kingdom of the Isles and the Rivers. Because uh, remember, uh, Heron the Black had uh, conquered the Riverlands uh, as part of Iron Island territory. So the Iron Islands and the... Uh, Riverlands would have been one kingdom. Well, that's six, because remember, he doesn't conquer Dorne. Uh, in fact, you can argue Dorne is not conquered. Uh, remember, they, they sort of form a mutual treaty with the seven kingdoms. Uh, this is, uh, you know, gives us a lot of Dorne's unique privileges. Uh, so, for instance, the, the rulers of Dorne are still princes, uh, rather than just wardens of wherever. Uh, there's their own laws. You know, we, uh, there's a, a, seems to be a plot point developing with the use of Dornish law, uh, whereas, you know, we spend a lot of time in the north uh, with House Stark. And there's no, seems to be no distinction between northern laws and, you know, Crowdlander laws or anything. So they have their own laws, their own princes. Uh, and of course, remember the Martell words, unbowed, unbent, and broken because they didn't bow down and they didn't bend the knee and they have an unbroken line of succession uh, to the the to their uh, entrance into Westeros. Uh, so they wouldn't be included in part of those conquered seven kingdoms. Uh, and in fact, you could make the argument 
uh, and I, I don't know if this necessarily is sort of the legalistic uh, importance, this uh, the the importance of sort of their independence. Uh, you could argue reflects something more like an independent vassal kingdom uh, than actually a direct vassal in feudalism. Uh, so if we lean back a bit onto my previous video where I talked about uh, some of the pseudo histories in early medieval Ireland, we had uh, Oriel, which was a vassal kingdom of the O'Neills, uh, but it was still its own kingdom. You could argue that uh, there's a similar relationship happening here between Dorn and uh, and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, so that doesn't quite work. Uh, we can lean on Shokenen a little bit to try to, to help us uh, understand this. Uh, so for instance, uh, in the show, they talk about this concept of making the eight, which is uh, to having uh, your way, you know, having sex with a girl from each of the Seven Kingdoms and the Riverlands. Uh, so presumably the Riverlands aren't then one of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, this would sort of lean into that idea I mentioned earlier, where during the time of Aegon's conquest, uh, the Iron Islands and the Riverlands were one kingdom. Therefore, the Riverlands don't count as their own kingdom. Uh, so again, this, this would suggest we're leaning towards something like that, uh, the historical background of, uh, of the conquest of Westeros. But again, we, we can't quite square that off with being seven unless we then grant their own kingdom to something like the Crownlands, uh, which interestingly don't seem to, to have a historical background. You know, we can talk about the, the Kings of Winter, which uh, which formed the, the province of the North, or, you know, the Kings of the Reach formed the province of the Reach and so on. The Crownlands d doesn't seem to have that history. Uh, so again, I think... You know, we can mix and match which, which kingdoms or which territories are the seven kingdoms. Uh, you know, do the Riverlands count? Does Dorn count? Do the Crownlands count? Uh, and those sorts of questions. And uh, I absolutely think, yes, you can make arguments to, to pick a number to say, you know, these are the seven. And you could argue a, a good case for that. Uh, but I also think that somebody else could equally argue a good case that the seven kingdoms are distinctly different from the seven kingdoms you pick. Or again, making the argument that there's actually the six kingdoms or actually the nine kingdoms. Uh, but I don't think this is necessarily incorrect. I think that this vagueness uh, of the answer is actually an important part of understanding the seven kingdoms. Uh, that there's a, a nebulous number of kingdoms and we never get a straight answer. You know, nobody ever says the seven kingdoms are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, because I don't think that's actually why the seven kingdoms are seven kingdoms. I don't think it's necessarily a, a legalistic argument based off of how they divide up the territory of the seven kingdoms or a historical argument about who was conquered when. Uh, but I think rather... Uh, that there was a nebulous amount of kingdoms, somewhere roughly between six and nine, and the number seven happens to be between six and nine, uh, and is very important to Westeros through the faith of the seven, uh, which obviously has seven as its important number through the the seven faces of the divine. Uh, sort of how you know Christianity sees uh, the Trinity. Uh, as you know, the, the three uh, persons of one God, uh, the seven seems to view the seven aspects of one deity. Uh, so we can see sort of this, this important number, number symbolism that we see in our real world with three, including people fudging numbers to make three, I think is what's actually happening in Westeros. It's not that there's a, a good, clear answer to what the seven kingdoms are, but rather there's some number of kingdoms. It might be seven kingdoms. If we get pressed on it, we can make up answers to what these seven kingdoms are. Uh, but really, I think the, the actual reason for why it's seven kingdoms instead of some other number is because of the importance of the number seven in Westerochi culture due to the faith of the seven, rather than any of those reasons. Uh, and that could explain why nobody goes through and names out the seven kingdoms, uh, because there, there's not really a, a great uh, concrete answer to what those seven are, but rather it's just reflecting that importance of the number seven. 
Uh, so that's my theory anyways. Uh, it's worth pointing out something I, I mentioned in the first video, that uh, these are observations based off of the main text uh, of the A Song of Ice and Fire novel series, uh, not the, the in-world histories. I imagine uh, the in-universe in histories, you know, things like Fire and Blood could be relevant to this section. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's it's worth considering this problem not through an actual lens of what are the Seven Kingdoms, but rather this recognition that there might not actually be Seven Kingdoms. It's just something I think is really interesting. Uh, and I imagine a, a bit of a more controversial hot take. So I'm very interested to see what you all say in the comments down below.